I would like welcome Vijaya Krishna to the virtual day of the midwife as our second keynote speaker of the conference. Vijaya is a certified professional midwife and the co-founder of the Healthy Mother Sanctum, the natural birth center, <clears throat> and the leading official Lamar's, Lamar's certified childhood educator in India. She teaches the Healthy Mother Lamar's accreditation childbirth educator program in order to educate and certify Lamar's educators all over India and also runs the Healthy Mother Breastfeeding Support Network. So I'm going to hand the baton over to you, Vijaya. Thank you, Linda. Um, and mute myself so I can have a proper cough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. I am um, so honored and thrilled to be invited uh, to this amazing virtual event and for this opportunity to speak with so many of you sister midwives and birth keepers and birth workers from across the world. Um, happy International Day of the Midwife to all of you. Um, and before I begin, I think I want to take a moment to remind you, each one of you, of the amazing, awesome, and life-altering work that you do every single day. Uh, congratulations, kudos. Uh, we are celebrating not only the International Day of the Midwife, but also 2020 as the year of the nurse and midwife. So um, while 2020 has brought some um, honestly, um, odd sets of events together. I think we are uh, in the year where midwifery is actually being recognized across the world. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so before I begin, I would like to thank all the mothers and fathers who have given permission to uh, use their photographs in the presentation. Um, so yes, I am uh, a midwife and I'm the co-founder of the Sanctum Natural Birth Center in Hyderabad, India. And um, it's a one of a kind birth center with a collaborative model of care, which is what we are going to be talking about a little bit more in detail um, later on in the presentation. Um, so before, let me go right on. So um, it would be um, very appropriate at this time to recognize the contribution of um, all our traditional birth attendants across the world. We do come from a long tradition of midwifery in the country. Um, birth, uh, traditionally, 70% of the births were, um, were at least over, a, over several decades ago. Of course, almost all the births happened at home, but even um, you know, a few years, few, few years ago, there was at least 70% of the births that were happening in the homes because a large part of the of India is still fairly rural and suburban. But then, of course, government and those policies and initiatives, obviously, to um, to which have impacted the institutionalization of childbirth. And while this presentation does not have the ability to go over all of that, we do have to still recognize that there are midwives practicing and delivering, um, you know, uh, um, excellent and extraordinary services in the country to the uh, women when they where they need them. So uh, yeah, we do come from a long tradition of midwifery until decades ago, midwives were the keepers of birth in India. And one thing which is remarkable when I see this slide is that, um, you know, all the things that we talk about in um, midwifery today, as we know it, keep the, uh, keep the lighting dim, keep everything personal, ensure that there are women supporting other women. These women already knew what they were doing years ago. Uh, so the ageless wisdom of Indian midwives was passed down generations from ancient times. And uh, Janet Chavla, who is, um, is, has done some stellar work in the country with her organization Matrika and the Jiva project where she has gone and looked at um, what traditional birth attendants and practices were in her birth. In her book, she writes about, you know, um, midwives knowing that not to, um, you know, cut the cord. And if the baby was not breathing at birth, um, they would uh, heat up the placenta and then milk the cord to revive the baby. So this ageless wisdom obviously has been there and it has been passed down generation to generation. So, but just in over a century, giving birth has changed from being there 
to here, which basically again tells us, you know, where the midwifery was with hands-on skills, palpation, um, women actually listening to women, and uh, here we are with the with the current set of scenarios where essentially because of volumes, because of medical education, literally a woman gets into the office for an appointment and she gets five minutes and she's told to lie down. A scan is done. It's very very hands off, and maybe there is a little, you know. Uh, a five minute or two minute conversation. She is prescribed medicines, prescribed tests, and eventually that's where we land up with lots of interventions and perhaps a cesarean section. So, of course, the medical system in its wisdom has decided that, you know, birth is essentially, and, and this is not just that doctors and hospitals are bad, it is just that the way of teaching, the medical education, generally looks at birth as an emergency, a disaster waiting to happen, unless otherwise proven. And uh, years ago, when we were just starting up um, in 2006, 2007, and when I was looking at births happening in the hospitals, um, there was a birth where I was just observing and, uh, you know, an episiotomy was going to be cut. And I said, why are you cutting the episiotomy? And the doctor actually chuckled and said, every baby has a big head unless otherwise proven. And that basically sums up the situation with the, mid uh, with the medical science sort of education and the way they look at birth. So there is an atmosphere of fear that restricts a woman's choice. There is family involvement, which sometimes can be overbearing, but sometimes is restricted. We still often see, although it is improving, we still often see that even the partners, the fathers, or other, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, um, significant other is prevented from entering the room for a checkup and especially for even scans. And I always often wonder, you know, what had, what has the partner not seen before that we are saying don't come in, you know. So that sort of involvement is restricted. There is blind trust in the care providers. Um, there is caregivers. There is uh, fear. There is lack of knowledge. And therefore, suddenly we have come to the point where interventions have become like the accepted new normal. So this is the challenge of the increasing cesarean rates. And unfortunately, the state that I live in, Telangana, which is towards the southern part of the country, um, is uh, actually the sort of the, the has one of the worst statistics as far as cesareans are concerned. It has uh, in, in the private sector, it has about 75 to 80 percent known cesarean rates. In some of the hospitals, those cesarean rates top 90 percent. And so essentially, unless a baby is actively falling out, there, there is a lot of cesareans that are being done and the, the the sad part is even the public institutions where traditionally the women because of whether it was volume whether it was because of lack of uh, resources as in the doctors where the women were actually allowed to labor and i hate this word allowed and i always use it with a lot of caution but where they were allowed to labor and uh, give birth um, more uh, at least deliver vaginally if not naturally even those rates are going up remarkably and telangana today has somewhere between a 48 to a 52 percent and in some, by some statistics, even a 58% cesarean rate, even in public institutions, which is essentially the hardy, low, low, relatively lower risk women are giving birth. So uh, this is a study that came out recently. India might soon have the most uh, cesarean section rates. And current estimates show that India has doubled the world's average of cesarean rates in the last decade. And those are some uh, and some sobering statistics. And I think it, it's all of us should sit up and take notice, whether it is public policy uh, policymakers or um, people who are in the midwifery world who are trying to push for better midwifery care, because we know that midwifery care can contribute to reducing these numbers significantly. So what is the nature of the problem? It is generations have not had a normal birth. Uh, we have had women come into the uh, come into the um, center and after they've had their normal delivery after fighting hard to even come into the center to give birth because we are still considered after than 12 years, we are still considered um, an alternative care provider. And uh, generation, when they have their birth, they will say, you know, I'm the only one in the family who has had a normal delivery, and I'm really proud of it. And we will say, yes, you should be ex extremely proud because not only have you made a difference to your life, but now you're able to pass that wisdom of living in your natural birth to your daughter or 
daughter and daughter-in-law a friend or other people in the community so i think this is something which is very crucial there is fear in families that is passed on to mothers and it's just interesting that you know when you look at uh, two generations back for example the great grandmothers or even the grandmother's generations, they usually will say, you know, um, yes, I was working at the home, I was working in the field, I, you know, had some contractions, it felt like pain, I felt it was gassiness or discomfort. And then, you know, I continued my work and I gave birth fairly easily to the to one generation down where it is the mothers of these moms who are pregnant right now. And they also have, many of them have had normal deliveries, but it has all been in the hospitals. And then the current, uh, you know, focus where there is all this medicalization of childbirth because they are seeing their nieces, nephews, wives, you know, their own cousins or whatever give birth in the medicalized environment. There is so much fear, not only in the antenatal period during labor and birth, but also in the postpartum period where even breastfeeding, a simple act biological happen naturally for most women is considered like you know I, unless otherwise proven the mother has no milk so there is a lot of fear in the families which is passed on listening to elders the doctors become more important and this is again a very cultural um, sort of issue because sometimes you know in the when we see the family for the first checkup often it is not just the mother who walks into the room it's the mother her partner her mom her mom-in-law maybe her sister or her sister-in-law and we have suddenly five people into the room obviously how is she going to feel even confident to speak her mind and you know they'll they'll expect like with folded hands sometimes say doctor is my daughter or daughter-in-law well and what can you say about her condition as if it is a disease process that someone needs to diagnose you know and it is just so heartbreaking sometimes to see that and finally when they leave the room a lot of them will say I'm putting my daughter into your hands and I think these words ring in my ears because it is just such a way to sort of handle the mother and it's it's a cultural culturally we are to be so that and sort of try to break that in pieces where we say you know why don't you all go out i've talked to you i can't just say i will not speak with you because i know they will never come back to see me but you know say okay i've heard all of you but may i have some time with your daughter or daughter-in-law and then eventually a lot of the women who understand this model of care and it has become better over the years they will come in and they will talk and you know then they will bring their you know the elders or so on and so forth but it is almost as if she is married then she goes to the to, to her husband's home and then she's brought to for her delivery over here and she's essentially like the child belongs to the family and she's a vessel to give birth and there is a lot of that which also uh, causes the problem to multiply superstitions are built through blind faith uh, and of course from the doctors and obviously though I, we all know that googling is not the best form of of uh, you know uh, finding out the best information again they are ridiculed and questioned and saying oh you know uh, you google for five minutes and how are you better than me um, so that's part of the problem um, so, and then the other part of the problem, obviously created by the medical profession, C-sections are the only options available for anything where there seems to be a slight, slightly off from the norm, gestational diabetes, low AFI, high AFI, and because there is not extraordinary protocols and because there is not an oversight that is available um, hospital to hospital and there is no need to declare numbers, it is just some hospitals might say, I will wait for two hours. Some hospitals might perform um, internal exams starting 35 weeks. So there is really no standardization and everything ultimately lands up. If you have a cross tie or a bent toenail along with your pregnancy, you might land up getting a cesarean section. Uh, cesarean section is directly suggested many times for twins cord around the neck a huge problem, a huge problem because they will bold it saying it's when they go in for their multiple multiple scans they will bold it saying that the, the, you have a cord around the neck and you know what's even more funny sometimes they will say the cord lies near the neck and they will bold it and so the all these uh, fears come into the woman and then she eventually lands up having unnecessary interventions and of course this is their section. the due date myth huge you know cross your due date you have an induction or a cesarean section vaginal exams may be not high inductions for no valid reasons i talked about that um, so is a healthy baby all that matters? Women grow babies.
uh, without a woman at best, at best uh, the baby would not exist, right? So, and the argument across the world, I think, but as of course, I'll talk about that, but your baby is healthy, why are you not happy? And 2013, the birth rights survey was done in the UK, and those who experienced care that they perceived as disrespectful, abusive, or negative were far more likely to have negative feelings about themselves, and those memories were vivid for a lifetime. Similarly, listening to mothers, there were three surveys done. The last survey, there were high levels of interventions. 68% were still confined home to the hospital and experience completely optimal healthy birth practices. And this is, you know, in countries where actually there is some transparency of care. And here, when we talk about India, we don't even know what these numbers actually might look like. So birth has its dangers, of course, but the privilege does not need to be paid for by foregoing rights to dignity, autonomy, and choice. So what is respectful care? Factory line care can become inhumane. Yes, we do have large numbers. And yes, we always have to look at how can we make it scalable. But essentially, I always feel that midwifery has to be the front line of all of this care because midwifery is care is more personal. It is more individualized. And it is meant to not be for large numbers. But when there are, when there are larger number of midwives, they would take care of uh, smaller cohorts of pregnant women and hopefully make it, uh, you know, that one-on-one -on -one personalized care but generally when we when we look at um, you know what is happening currently there is no dignity no privacy pubic shaving and anema have reduced over the last few years government is putting the indian government has put across many programs and some of these um, you know practices which should have been relegated into the 1920s and 1940s or which should never have started in the first place uh, are now getting, you know, that, that's being stopped in even the, um, you know, in the government institutions and so on and so forth. The internal exam, my women will tell us very often when they come for their second delivery to us or when they come for a VBAC, they will tell us that, um, you know, the pain of the internal exam was more than the pain of labor and birth. And what are we doing to these women? That is the, that's the ultimately, when we look at even midwifery in larger practices, I've had students come from across the world and sometimes they will point out to me that this is the midwifery care that we learned in textbooks but now we don't practice it anymore because of the volumes, because of, you know, shift and because of other things that come into play, induction and augmentation. In fact, all interventions, almost all interventions have no informed consent. It is, you know, you can tell somebody, you know, by starting the drip, you can have a baby in three hours without telling her ever, you know, about all the risks that, you know, induction and augmentation can, can um, you know, cause. Um, uh, food is withheld still. Many hospitals will uh, will have a list of small number of things that they can take, including some water and maybe like a very light meal, but still really not allowing the woman to eat as much as she wants, lying on the delivery table for hours. Stirrups are becoming less, but still many places it is used. Episiotomy still very routine. Even for in most hospitals, for a first time mom, an episiotomy is a rate is between ninety to one hundred percent. Fundal pressure, cord is clamped, and we call this an delivery. So a little intervention here, a little intervention there. I'm sure all of you have, have, have experienced at some point or another, or some of you have experienced at some point or another, this kind of care where the baby is essentially pulled out of the mother. And that the, the face that, that is over here is sort of exemplified in how she feels about the birth. It is a trauma. There is nothing joyful about giving birth. And I love this quote from Rhea Dempsey that it might seem counterintuitive that in an activity experienced only by women, women are nonetheless pushed to the bottom of the power hierarchy and are treated so appallingly, but this is the case. So can a mother labor in peace? Of course, we know she can. This is a woman who is uh, ready to push her baby out and she is in the tub squatting with her husband next to her. You can't hear anything? Any better? Okay. All right. Is birth without cutting anything possible? Of course it is. 
is birth a directed pushing possibility? Of course it is. This is a mom who traveled from Delhi to give birth with us. She was a VBAC mom and, uh, and she had had a very, very traumatic birth experience. And this time she landed up almost catching her own baby. You do see my hands as the baby was born in the call at the very bottom right of the picture, but, um, but she almost caught her own baby. So um, yeah, I think that's the power that we have to let women experience. Can the baby get to know her mother before touching others? I'm sorry, this uh, I, I don't know whether this picture is looking elongated, but on my slide it is. I, it looked okay when I did the um, presentation on my computer, so excuse that slide. And this couple actually had a normal delivery at another hospital for the first uh, birth, but she wanted um, you know, a more untouched, a more gentle birth and chose our care. And they caught their baby in the water birth with four hands. And yes, there is such a lot of oxytocin in that picture, right? Oxytocin and love, that, that, that's their circle of love. Yep, can the baby be born gently? Yes, of course. Can the placenta be honored as the baby's nourishing G in uh, G is, means life? So can that placenta be, can be on, can it be honored? Yes, of course. This is that moment of pause that we talk about, right? Where we don't touch, we don't prod, we let that woman experience that minute of birth in whatever emotion she wants. The mom here is experiencing it really quietly. The mom here is elated, but let that woman have that moment of pause and none of us, you know, talk or move or do things to disturb that moment. And, and then, um, unless there is an emergency, of course. So what is an autonomous midwife? I don't want to go belabor this because most of you over here do understand this. And it is, she is the, um, you know, the clinical care provider who is the expert at normal birth. It's what she would do, what, what in a hospital would do in a typical hospital setting. And uh, she provides the antenatal checkups, counseling, one-on-one -on -one labor support, um, and everything to help the mother baby. And she's also able to recognize complex needs and complications and refer to the OBGYN on the team when, they are, when it is needed. So there is absolutely that WHO recommends midwife-led continuity of model of care. It supports a woman throughout her antenatal period, intrapartum and postpartum period, and supports healthy parenting choices. So what do women want? They want a supportive, caring relationship with a midwife or a small number of midwives. They don't want to be hurried. They want to have a woman-centric approach. And this approach actually improves their confidence. And we will, we will talk about the numbers and our statistics, but it actually improves their confidence in their own bodies to give birth. There are no strangers in the room, and there is less fear. And these are all the uh, sub, for the continuous labor support, which a midwife offers, which doulas offer as well. And there is so many findings that we should not be ever looking at birth without that uh, continuous labor support. So where we did come in was um, in 2005 and 2006, I was uh, teaching Lamas classes. And uh, what we would find is while the, the couples initially, well, it was actually a pretty unknown quantity at that time, because whenever we talked about classes, people thought that it would be some kind of exercise program, or they would come in with a question mark as to what we were going to teach. We would start teaching individual couples one at a time, like one-on-one, -on -one and, and then sort of talk to them about what that they did have a choice about the way they gave birth. And they were like, what choice? What do you mean choice? And anyway, as we went through that process, um, when we started getting our first bigger classes, like four people, five people, six couples in the, in the class, 90% of them landed up with a cesarean section because the last mile failed them. They would do all the things and they would talk to the doctors, but when they would go in, they would find that they were back in the same maternity environment, which then did not respect their choices, nor did they even know I don't think the medical care provider even uh, sort of acknowledged what these people were talking about. So, where, so what we thought, what would happen if we could create a new model of care where the woman would be at the center of the care universe 
access all the benefits of the midwife-led continuity of care and continuous labor support, and still have access to the safety net of access to the emergency medical interventions and cesarean section. And not only that, this is there all over the world, but what would happen if it were in the same premises? And that's where in 2008, we actually decided to change the status quo. And um, my, uh, my backup obstetrician, uh, Dr. Jayanti Reddy, she has had an immense contribution to this entire um, you know, birth center model in the country, which is unique in the country, but also only a few across the world where it is an autonomous midwife-led independent model of care, but has the emergency backup infrastructure services in-house. Uh, she has been a tremendous uh, champion of that. And so we created this model. We would talk hours on end as to how it would work. We would say, you know, what would be the protocols? When would we look at transferring? And because this was an unknown quantity, we decided that we would rent one room in, within her hospital and we would start working on the uh, protocols and start working on, you know, what we knew would work best with the midwife-led model of care, but then also look at what would be the uh, circumstances under which we would transfer. But the beauty of this was that this was already a, a maternity um, maternity uh, hospital where they had the all the infrastructure that was available for both the cesarean section as well as all the staff that was there so that's where we started out one room and then it became two rooms and our office initially was so small that if one person walked in one person would have to walk out and then um we would we were two people we would still do all the payments in cash which was really it which is really funny because uh now when we look at it we don't we are in this current covid situation nobody handles cash and we do uh, we sanitize the uh, credit card and use gloves to handle you know anything so it's uh, it's really kind of funny where we have come and how far we have come from but that allowed us to perfect the model uh, over eight years that we were inside of the hospital and many people would wonder how does one maternity care hospital exist in the another maternity care hospital it became a very synergistic relationship and what landed up happening as a result of that initially the doctors they would not understand who we were because remember in this country there is only the autonomy the ANM who is basically an auxiliary nurse midwife or she is called a multi-purpose health worker and she has perhaps about six weeks of obstetric nursing as a as a training and or the the graduate nurse midwife who has the um, you know the the about six months of obstetrical nursing of course then there is the BSc nursing and all of those things, but generally the the, the people who are working uh, under the obstetricians and the obstetric-led model of care, uh, they did not understand what autonomous midwifery was, and so for them it was like some high-priced hand-holding service. And to educate them and to say that we are not bringing in train wrecks to see you when we refer people, and we we understand where the riskier, uh, you know, the where the higher risk women are, and we will refer to you in time, and so. That that really actually, um, thank you, Linda. So I will I will speed up my presentation. So that actually led to a lot of uh, you know um, a work, and then in 2006 we landed up moving into our own independent birth center. Which has the collaborative model of care. Led by independent midwives. Supported by in house OBGYNs and medical list have on 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 board with us on an as need basis physicians and anesthetists we have pediatricians to complete that continuity of care and provide the same gentle care and gynecologists to provide infertility and other gynec related things so we are basically created an entire coexisting system within our system and emergency infrastructure, which basically means a, a, an operating theater, a level one NICU. And because in the country we don't have a birth center as a, as a recognized entity, what we have, and basically we also wanted people to access insurance, we have what we have is, a, um, is classified as a level three hospital, and therefore it takes care of all the regulatory and licensure requirements as well. Um, so this is our birth center. I'll just go through a few photographs and it's a labor of love and we have created it to look like a home as much as possible. 
simple. Every room has a water tub and we use waters, uh, water very regularly. Almost 90% of all our women use water for aquadural for pain relief and uh, uh, quite a number, 30 to 40% any given year have water birth. Uh, sanctum is the Garbhagriha, which is the home of the womb, and that's where the, uh, the deity resides in a temple. Um, the women are goddesses, and the womb, the holy place where the birth happens. So what have been our results? This has been our cesarean sections have been at 10% since inception. Currently, they are at 7.2%. The 10% from inception has been because, like I said, for the first two to three years, it took time to perfect the model of care where people, where the obstetricians, we, it, we cannot be like a bull in a china shop saying, this is the only way we know, and this is, you know, we, we would like for X, Y, Z to happen. And it took some amount of, um, you know, back and forth before we could uh, perfect the model of care where they feel comfortable attending the births, which were even a higher risk. So um, that's where the that's where we started off at. And the hospital where we started had an 83% cesarean rate when we started. Slowly, they started saying, if Healthy Mother Sanctum can do it, so can we. And currently, they are at a 53% cesarean rate, which is still pretty high. But I think we have impacted the community as well. So by the numbers, this is uh, we have medical inductions because we also take the higher risk women. It is not just the low risk women. We have gestational diabetics. We have high blood pressure. We have breech births. We have uh, which have happened twin births. Um, so and um, so because of that, um, we ha we have had medical inductions, but we also use a lot of natural induction methods whenever appropriate and available. So our medical inductions are under five percent. Epidurals are 0.8. That is eight out of fifteen hundred births. Vacuum deliveries at 0.5 percent. Five out of fifteen. 100 births, forcep deliveries at 0.2%, 2 out of 1,500 births, and episiotomy rates at 6%. I won't run through everything because I know I have a limited time. Our premature births are less than 1%, readmission rates are almost zero, and we have breastfeeding rates of 100% at six weeks and discharge. This past year, there have been a couple of women who have struggled, and when, especially when they have transferred to a tertiary care and ICU. So I think currently, if I do the rate uh, for today, it might be more like at a 98 percent, but still pretty good rates, I would think. Um, a VBAC success rates, I think these, we are very, very, very um, honored to, and uh, that we are privileged to support VBAC any given month because of the high number of primary cesarean rates. Uh, one third of our caseload happens to become VBAC. And we have a, a, we have an overall 90% VBAC success rate. And some years we have had a 96% VBAC success rate. And VBAC A to C, we have a 98% uh, VBAC A to C success rate. That tells us something thing that women know how to give birth. Uh, babies know how to be born and we have to be there to support them. And um, this is, again, I'll go through this. And any of you who want to look at this presentation can do so later. Um, but we have had, you know, many, many births where uh, we have had, uh, you know, preterm births. 1.57 was our smallest baby that was born. Our biggest baby was 4.31 in, in 2018. In 2019, we had a 4.6 kg baby born to a 4 feet 6 inch woman. So yes, birth works. Um, and like this, this slide again goes through a quite a bit of, you know, like detail, but basically we have all the women who have had natural birth with complex needs, women with previous loss, women with IVF and assisted reproduction, where essentially they are told, oh, this is a precious pregnancy, plan your baby at 37 weeks, have a C-section, IVF, assisted reproduction, women have also given birth and many of them at 42 weeks complete. Twins, we have had nine sets of twins who have been born um, with, since inception. Of course, a lot of the twin moms don't even touch us. They go to the routine hospitals. But we have had nine sets of twins uh, who have been born naturally. Only two sets of twins since inception have actually um, had a, uh, a cesarean section for uh, both of them for high blood pressure. PIH with twins. Breach, we have had nine uh, breech babies born, and the, the the one of the moms had both of her breech babies with me, and this is really funny. I kind of love to tell the story. Her first baby was born breech at 35 weeks, and her second baby was born breech at 43 weeks complete, and that gave me some gray hairs. Gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, high BMI, low BMI. We have had women 
137 kgs give birth and we have had women with 127 kgs give birth naturally um, pesky edd 41 weeks complete 100 percent 42 weeks complete 98 43 weeks complete 100 percent so yes we again women know how to give birth so what are, the, what are the other interesting facts to note? Um, the couples attend Lamas classes. We essentially make that one of the absolute essentialities for giving birth with us, though we really don't want to force people. I feel very strongly that unless there is education, unless there is opening out of the minds, unless the fear gets reduced, there is no, no point in us standing up on a podium and saying natural birth is great. The women and their partners have to believe. So once they attend Lamas classes, a lot of them will actually say, wow that was the game changer now we have become players in our own births and i think that's so lovely to hear couples who have felt that continuity of care helped of course 100 percent what are the secret behind the numbers um, relentless focus on continuity of care and every antenatal checkup the first checkup lasts for an hour hour and a half where we touch upon every aspect of the uh, pregnancy you know um, and then every checkup lasts 30 minutes informed consent 24 7 labor support um, partner and family are fully involved in every aspect of birth just yesterday we had a wee back mom who because of the covid situation her partner is quarantined in the middle east and she is here and we we did Skype the partner in at birth, and it was amazing to see his tears flow. She was fine, but his tears were flowing. So yes, I think it's it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely essential to involve laser focus on diet and exercise throughout pregnancy. We have a well wellness wing as well, which is called a Well Mom, and where we work on prenatal yoga starting right from the first trimester. Go on with Lamas classes. Go on with prenatal aerobics, which I have designed. I in my past life I was also a physiotherapist and that helps quite a lot for me to work with the fitness aspect of it and so um, we have designed our prenatal aerobics program which people enjoy a lot and it's amazing to see women doing jumping jacks and military crawls and in, in, after 36 and 37 weeks lama's healthy birth practices again i'll forward that um, education like you like we said the lama's classes there's all our prenatal yoga, our aerobics, and this mom on the right, um, she is a yogini herself, and this was taken just a few days before she gave birth, and look at her. That's a strong, confident woman who is ready to embrace birth, and I cannot tell how beautiful and how overwhelmingly, um, you know, soul-satisfying it is to see these women transform into this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, embracing their pregnancy and their childbirth experience. So what do women want? They don't want consultations. They want good counseling. They, they, they don't want to be told this is your only plan. They want permission before touching or performing procedures. And I think we have had um, gynecologists give birth themselves. We have had emergency care physicians give birth with us. Even my, uh, my, back, my partner, Dr. Jayanti's own daughter-in-law, gave birth with us. And one of the things that I remember, the gynec, when she was in labor, and I asked her permission before touching and doing an internal exam, she said to me, oh, this is how an internal should be done. And yes, I think that's where she, she understands what that feeling is in her own body, where she is now going to go back into the community. And she said it has absolutely changed the way she sees women and, you know, how she treats women in, you know, who are under her care right now. No fear in the birth room, calm and quiet environment let the mother lead and i think that's so important let the mother lead respect her wishes support her emotionally and avoid invasive practices and that leads to a memorable and happy birth outcome what would a mother want this or this Women want natural birth and a good birthing experience. Like Sue Down says, it's not either or. It is that 
and this natural birth and a good birthing experience. At the moment, there are only two autonomous midwife led birth centers in India. The numbers are huge. Cesarean sections are three times higher. And this not only is escalating the cost, and I think for people, the uh, you know uh, the money actually does talk. And I think everyone of us who is uh, who is uh, involved in the process to bring change has to say that cesareans escalate the cost, not only the cost but also the burden uh, of the care that is provided to them. And of course, you know we all we know that there are, there are 33 other outcomes that are poorer when there is cesarean sections. Respectful maternity care with good informed consent. And of course, in India, we have both the too little, too late, where there is still maternity and infant mortality because of that and too much too soon where like we said in the urban hospitals that we see there is way too much intervention and um, cesarean sections. So what has birth happened and how has birth happened in Corona times? I cannot uh, end this presentation without talking about this a little bit. India has been on a complete lockdown. We are still in lockdown in our state um, until the 17th. This is the third time the lockdown has been extended. Everything that midwifery has always known is now having to be embraced by the obstetric community. No multiple early scans, you know, e-teleconferencing. Women are not being put on progesterone, or at least less of them are being put on it. Less tests, less scans, less doctor's visits. But now, because the community has only known of pregnancy as a risk and uh, get up, pee on a stick, visit the doctor, there is a lot of confusion and anxiety about these um, multiple consultations and scans. And I think slowly, hopefully, this model of care will be embraced. Um, you know, as we go along, that it's okay to not have too many interventions, especially early on. Um, some uh, hospitals, unless a woman is a multiple, and I know we have heard from colleagues, we've heard from different care providers, that because of unknown fear of corona in some hospitals, unless a woman is a multiple and at five to six centimeters, everyone is getting a C-section, even if they show up in labor, which is to me unconscionable. Um, labor support, which already was non-existent in many hospitals, has been further disallowed. C-section rates are dramatically further increasing. At the sanctum, we have been using what we have been doing so far to uh, to sort of uh, work in the same model of care that we have worked below. We have been using our ambulance to drop up and pick up essential staff as public transport is completely closed. And most of the uh, nurses and the other housekeeping staff uh, and even the admin staff depend on the public transport. And so we have been using our ambulance, which has not never been or very less been used for other things now to pick up our staff. And we have been instituted 48 hour on call chips for our midwives, 24 hours for nurses, so that we can reduce footfalls in the community. And because we have the collaborative model of care and in-house OT and ICU, um, and this is a typo over here, our cesarean rates actually since the beginning of the lockdown has is at 4.2%, including mothers with high risk. So I think it's possible we have had actually one cesarean section over the last um, two and a half months. Our continuity of care has enabled good follow-up from the antenatal to the postpartum period. So as frontline caregivers, midwives can provide care with empathy. And like Sheena Byram says, kindness costs nothing, empathy costs nothing, and love comes back to you 100%. And I really, really believe in that. Midwifery model of care is women-centric and it can allow for an empowered birth. And the solution, I think, wherever you are across the world with good um, independent midwives can be an autonomous midwife-led care, establishing partnerships with the OBGYNs and other um, you know, medical care providers in the community and implementing a collaborative model of care. And look at that picture, that says it all. Mother and father looking at each other, baby nursing peacefully, and that's what we want to, all of us want to see, isn't it? And with that, I'll end my presentation. And thank you for listening patiently. And thank you for all that you do for mothers and babies every day. And I'll leave this as the last slide so that if you want to know where we are at you, uh, in, on the media and the digital platforms, you can definitely look us up. Thank you very much for listening patiently. Many, many thanks, Vijaya. That's a fabulous um, presentation. And I, I let it run on because I think you were answering the questions that people were asking. Um, so uh, I, we really don't have much time for questions. Does anybody have an urgent question? 
Otherwise, I suggest that you contact Vijaya through her website or Facebook page or on Instagram. Any urgent questions? I've got a quick one, if you can answer it. Answer it. Um, well, it's not really a quick one. Um, in, in India, do women have the right to say no? Legally? No. I think they have a right to say no. Of course, they have a right to say no. But uh, but I think the more important question to be um, you know asked about is do they know that they have a right to say no? Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's really the question because I think when especially when women are always being in a dependent state where they have been you know their part may have been chosen for them when they then there is a certain a cultural uh, norm about women being more uh, you know like a part of the family and the baby uh, you know is a is like the is being made for the family so to speak I think it becomes really hard there is also this whole thing about you know there is not enough uh, sexual education reproductive education there are many women who get married and have uh, in, maybe like have had one um, you know um, um, uh, it, maybe have had sex once with their partner and have got conceived and then there is all this conception and then she is uh, you know told that you can't have sex in the pregnancy all through the pregnancy and then eventually culturally she goes off to her mother's place the husband is at his mom's place or by himself and you know in all this there is no coming into her own you know how does she feel about herself how does she feel about her pregnancy how does she feel about um, you know bringing a child into this world is that an is that an option that is given to her or is she expected to celebrate because making a baby is the social thing to do i think it is just there are so many layers to this that i don't think i have an answer but yes they have the right to say no but i don't know how they exercise that right Thank you very much. I think we'll need to stop it at that point. It's just that some, I agree with you that um, it's whether or not they know that. I mean, that, that applies here in the UK as well. Even now, we know that people don't understand that they have the right to say no. But I don't think in all cultures, legally, they have that right, which is the reason I was asking. And I knew it wasn't a very easy question to answer, but there you go. OK, so thank you very much indeed, Vijaya. And well, I hope that we can work together some more because your message is relevant to everybody in the world, not just in India and the resource poor countries, um, but Thank also so much. In many of our developed countries could well, would well listen to what you have to say as well. And all student midwives should listen to this. It will.